called One Day a DJ Saved My Life. I made up my mind to kill myself when I was 20 years old. I like to think of it as an era of suicidal thought. It wasn't just one time, one instance, and everything was perfect. It was a constant thought because my problems, well, they were constant. Just like learning to love yourself is a process, moving away from negative thoughts of self-harm is also a process. But two moments from that era helped me to believe in the power to proceed. I start to acknowledge my same-sex attraction in college. It's probably clear to many of the friends I had constantly debated with about gays in the military and whether homosexuality was a sin. My friend Jeff joked recently that during my freshman year, all I ever wanted to argue about was politics and eventually homosexuality. By the time I was a sophomore, I was wound so tight that friends came over to watch football with their shirts off, because that's what you do when you're in a dorm growing down. I'd run to the bathroom and splash cold water on my face. I know, real dramatic. Somehow, during the course of the year, I got involved in a relationship with a resident advisor who had sought to counsel me about my feelings. It was a whirlwind. I gave it to a crush for the first time in my life, and it was a secret, a thrilling, amazing secret. And as a side note, I didn't say this before, it was snowing out in Michigan, so it was awesome. We'd go for walks, and be really quiet, and the snow would be crunching, and invisible light would just come out, and we'd be my hair, so it's all spinning, so right? <laughs> but as relationships go, he wanted more. In this case, for us to be public and open about our relationship, and I got scared. I thought about all the things that would change, how my family would react, my church, and the girl with whom I was madly in love. Up until this point, I had done a good job of compartmentalizing my affections. Because gay activity was a sin, somehow it wasn't real, and thus had no bearing on the rest of my life. My goal to get married and have three kids would not change. Change did occur, however, when I informed my counselor boyfriend that I didn't want to see him anymore. And he lashed out. All of the fears, insecurities, and dread that I had shared with him were suddenly thrown back in my face with twisted flair. In retrospect, I get that he was hurt by my rejection of him and reacted as many people would in that situation. But at the time, it felt like my entire world had collapsed. I started having panic attacks while sitting in class, grabbing hold of my desk to prevent myself from running out. I envisioned my parents getting a letter in the mail like a kid the year before, whose parents received a Michigan Daily photo of him kissing a guy at the queer kissing. I wondered how hot hell would actually be. Finally, the tears and fears culminated one blustering night in February. I grew up Pentecostal. Don't go to the movies, listen to non-gospel music, or wear sneakers to church, because that's a sin. I believe I was called to be a minister when I was a teenager but I didn't follow through because of anxiety about my sexuality. From as long as I can remember, I knew I was gay. But I also knew homosexuality was not sanctioned by the church. AIDS had arrived on the scene as God's punishment for them nasty men's when I was six. And I wondered if I would get AIDS by holding hands with boys as I desired. I witnessed many an altar call to pray with the gay from members of my church and the community. It was mad stressful, to say the least. Fourteen years of pent-up Pentecostal frustration led to a chilly winter night when I was about to jump off the building on the University of Michigan campus. My theory went like this. If I'm destined to end up in hell and undeserving of God's love, why not just kill myself and get it over with? I didn't wear a jacket because it was cold. For some reason, I thought about Dante's Inferno and the depiction of a frozen Satan encased in ice. The rapid removal of heat from your body burns like dry ice. It was a brilliant idea, but also an extremely scary one I felt doomed to experience firsthand. I did not think about my family who adored me or what effect my death would have on them. I just wanted my pain to end. I wanted God to love me just as I am. I got to the edge and looked down. Then something happened. When I was growing up attending even juggle tent revivals, the elder saints used the phrase, call Jesus. If your brakes go out on your car, call Jesus. If you don't think you have enough money in your bank account to cover the mortgage this month, call Jesus. Whenever trouble comes your way, 
called Jesus, and he will fix it by and by. So I was looking at the ground, preparing myself for the unknown. I asked God for help with my heart. I called out the name Jesus. What transpired is why for the rest of my life, whether I attend church or not, regardless of what preacher so-and-so says on television, I know that I am a child of God. My knees buckled and landed on the roof of the building. At the same time, I felt a wave of love wash over me, and I started praising God for that wave, for that love, for that blessed understanding and assurance. I tried to stand, but I couldn't. I kept praising and praying in the cold on that chilly roof for what seemed like forever. When I was finally able to rise to my feet, I turned around as I stood up and headed back inside, crying my eyes out. God had literally picked me up, turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I still get chills just thinking about it. And I'm crying a little bit as I write this because it was my faith that brought me back from the edge and sustained me ever since that day. So my response to all of the spiritual haters in the world is that God, Yahweh, Lily of the Valley, bright morning star, sweet Jesus, show me the light on a dark winter night. And no matter what you say or how loudly you say it, my relationship with my God is personal. You can never take that love away from me, no matter what. I could end right there. But my sadness, despite knowing I was a child of God, did not end that winter. I was on a path, but I did not know where I was headed. I took baby steps for the next several months, falling into and out of exploratory relationships with guys, trying to fix things with my girlfriend, and even dating new women, meeting more LGBT folk on campus, telling more of my close friends that I was open to dating guys, then changing my mind. Who knew what was in store for the future? When summer came, I made plans. I lived up the street from an independent video store that carried awesome gay themed movies and around the corner from a club, The Nectarine, that had game night twice a week. And I was there every Tuesday, Friday night, shaking my group thing. I was out, sort of. But at one point, I went back in after what I found in the club. And this is probably unfamiliar to most of you in LA. But uh, people obsessed with casual sex drug use, and gossip so vicious you think you need a rabies shot after talking with them. In retrospect, most of my friends, regardless of their sexual orientation, enjoy sex, have dabbled in drugs, and try to get rid of gossip as fast as they can by telling others. I had imagined a homo-utopia, where everyone was supposed to get along before they paired up and got married. Homo-utopia? One night, I felt particularly vulnerable. And I don't know what the trigger was. It could have been any number of things, really, but I felt like crap. And I went to the next ring because it was gay night. Yet, I didn't dance. I just sat in the days, looking out at the people and judging them all. Maybe what I was seeing was the pain acted out upon themselves and each other. I couldn't take it and wonder what kind of life I was trying to live. I wanted to be at home with one partner, not half the town. I wanted kids, even though the debates over gay marriage were more than a decade away. I wanted to be who I was before I acknowledged I was attracted to men. Not some wild, bizarre version of that guy who numbed himself with unprotected sex. Life as I knew it felt meaningless. I went home determined to kill myself. I decided I would take my life by asphyxiation this time, and I wrote some letters to loved ones. According to my plan, it was all going to go down the next day. I just had to get some supplies from the store in the morning. I set my alarm for early. I hated the wah wah sound my clock made and had it on radio alert. So it's just funny, just being fastidious when you're about to kill yourself is kind of entertaining to me. Like setting my alarm early so I wake up and you know have my plans in place. Um, so on that day, which I believe to be my last, I woke up to music. It would have been a miracle if the three songs I'm about to list played back to back, but they did play in the same set, and they're the only ones I remember. They were Biggie Smalls' One More Chance, Mary J. Blige's My Life, and Shantae Savage's I Will Survive. It felt like the disc jockey in the Detroit radio station was spinning just for me that morning. The series of those popular songs on the radio may not seem like a big deal to some, but it was for me. I grew up playing music, piano since as long as I can remember, and trumpet beginning when I was 10. Classical and jazz gave way to funk, rock, and doo-bop as I got older, but what stayed consistent was the role of music as a transcendent energy with the power to make you feel alive. When I heard tree frogs in Mississippi, car horns in New York City, and drummers chanting in Ghana, I felt the power of music, 
And when I finished graduate school, I spoke during one of the commencement ceremonies to offer praise to the Most High, who is the melody of my whistle. And the person who turns up his car radio because I've noticed the person in the crosswalk is walking in rhythm to the song I'm bumping. So on that fateful morning, what started off as an alarm telling me I'd come to the end of the road ended up being a signpost, letting me know that everything was going to be all right. One more chance made me begin to weigh my options because the words from the hook reminded me to give life one more chance. But still, I didn't budge. My life made me weep and sob because Mary always did it. And usually I find it to be depressing because it made me think of all the things I'd seen. But on this morning, I heard empowerment in the lyrics because it'll give you peace of mind and you will see the sun shine, and you get to free your mind, and things will turn out fine. By the time Shante came with her take on Gloria Gaynor's classic, I felt born to sing, I will survive. So long, bye 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 bye. So long, bye 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 bye. I came to realize that God could love me, but if I didn't love myself, it wouldn't matter. Goodbye suicide, hello life.